Coloring Crypto. This is episode 19 of Coloring Crypto. I'm your host, Gabe Colors. If you missed our last episode, it sort of blew up. It was awesome with uh, Dogecoin creator Jackson Palmer. Today, we've got Terrence Yang, a lawyer, a Wall Street finance guy, and a crypto advisor, and a voice I see all over Facebook with great opinions. We talk about ways for newbies to get involved in crypto, and the possibility of experimentation, and just a lot of excitement about the crypto space. So I'm Terrence Yang. I live in San Francisco, and I um, study, invest, and advise cryptocurrency startups and projects. I have a background from Wall Street where I worked at big law firms and big investment banks as a lawyer, transaction manager, and ultimately sales, and helped um, work on a lot of deals that were either regulated by the SEC or we made sure that they were exempt from normal public registration requirements of the SEC. That's awesome. And I'd love to talk about some of the details of what you're sure. learning in, about the SEC and the whole crypto world. But let's say yeah. that for let's say that for later and maybe sure. just give us give us your own um, the story of when did you first hear of cryptocurrency and what happened for you when that sort of switch flipped and you got really involved in it? Sure. So I heard about it in twenty twelve where I was at the Y Combinator demo day and Coinbase pitched and I also had a so I missed on that and then um, I knew about Funders Club and they had Coinbase listed there with a lower minimum. Funders Club is a lot like AngelList where you can accredited investors can as, invest smaller amounts so maybe like five thousand dollars instead of usual check size might be twenty five thousand minimum for angels and I passed on that as well. In fact, I don't even remember Coinbase pitching. At the YC demo day, they had like 83 companies in a day. It was crazy. Then I got um, heard about Bitcoin again in like 2013. And this time I remembered and got interested. And starting in 2014, I mentored at a Silicon Valley accelerator, their first Bitcoin accelerator class. So I kind of through luck um, or just responding quickly, I was able to give the first talk to that first class and made two investments in 2014 from that class. Do you, um, do you recall like what sure. it was that sunk in? Was it oh, more sure. just, yeah. Yes. So the idea that you could have a shared public ledger or shared sort of Excel spreadsheet that people could add to, but not subtract from or modify was very appealing to me. Because when I worked on Wall Street, we had a lot of trades. And in areas such as credit derivatives, this is all public. uh, We had a lot of backlog where, so, so the idea being that you could have many tra- many people do trades. Let's say you wanted to buy default insurance or a credit default swap. You wanted to buy protection on a particular credit that you thought might go bankrupt or, or you already own the bond or loan. So you wanted to buy protection in case the loan um, didn't perform. Then you would buy it from Goldman. Goldman would then flip it to Morgan Stanley. So Goldman sold you protection on Entity X and then bought it from Morgan Stanley, where I used to work. And then we would then offload our risk to Merrill Lynch. And it would kind of go on and on and on where you were kind of had this long chain where the ultimate buyer and seller had no idea who each other were. And there are all these banks in between because banks are market makers and we make markets and we would, depending on our traders view, um, be long or short. So you have this huge, so, so derivatives get a bad rap because they have a huge notional gross notional, but when you collapse the chain, it's very, um, small. The net notional is very small. The total, the amount that was ultimately 
traded the ultimate buyer and seller it's just one trade but there might be 50 trades in between it was hard to know how much exposure there actually was we knew what was less than what it seemed to be when you added up all the trades but we didn't know how much less so with um blockchain eventually they're gonna that technology or something better some variation of it will take care of problems like that do you have a sense in the history of wall street how much like how common was that 10 years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago is that a sort of a recent phenomenon in the last decade of just peace people passing it on and kind of like continually getting insurance on their investment with something like that so i think the volume exploded with swaps because with a swap you can bet on interest rates or bet on the direct the credit worthiness of a bond without having to own the underlying asset. So it takes a lot of capital, right, to buy a U.S. Treasury bond. If you want to buy a million dollars of Treasury bonds, you have to pay a million dollars. But if you just want to bet on interest rates, and so when you buy a bond, right, it goes up in value. If rates fall, then the price of your bond increases, but you have to buy the bond to benefit from that. Now, with a swap, you could just do a fixed floating swap where you can bet that rates will go up over time. For example, taking the floating rate so you get paid more as rates go up and you consistently pay the the fixed rate. So that would be one example. And then the the other example I want to talk about was uh, about uh, protecting yourself or trying to protect yourself if you have loan exposure to a bad credit. So if BlackBerry borrowed a lot of money from you and, but they were an important investment banking client. So you don't want to sell the loan because when you sell the loan, it requires their consent. The borrower has to consent. That's the way it normally works for institutional borrowers. So it's not like your mortgage. When you have a mortgage with your bank, they can resell it and they don't need your permission. You just get a notice in the mail. Congratulations. You now have a new lender pay your mortgage to XYZ bank instead of ABC bank. Okay, so BlackBerry will be what? Upset and threaten to cut off your investment banking business. So credit default swaps enabled you to synthetically hedge out your loan position. So you have loaned BlackBerry $100 million. They're not doing well. So you you no longer like this loan you have with BlackBerry, but you still, your investment bankers are not going to let you sell the loan without putting up a fight. So what do you do? You buy credit default swap protection on BlackBerry. So it's a credit default swap is like, just like technology can be used for good or bad. And it, the risk can be mismanaged, right? So. Now, if you got into this in 2013, 2014, um, You know, I'm thinking of uh, the recent news that Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan recently sort of retracted his statement from six months ago (laughs) that that Bitcoin was, I don't know if he called it a pyramid scheme or something. He said it was a fraud. He said it was a fraud, and then he just retracted that. Um, Sure. So at the time, in 2013, 2014, did you kind of feel like an anomaly um, amongst your colleagues? Like, what was that like? Uh, And I was surprised. So I remember going to New York in 2014, having a dinner with three very bright Wall Street people who worked on some of the most innovative products as traders, as private equity bankers, as um, hedge fund managers. And I was raving about Bitcoin and their response was at least two of the three, uh, one's a little more libertarian and anti-government. So I think he got, (laughs) I'm not, I'm not that by the way, but I think people who are that way tend to get it right away. Um, so their response was to the three people were, um, isn't that the thing that's used for drug for by drug dealers for money laundering? And I was like, oh my God, like that is, yes, one use case, but that's been true of every single technology that comes along. The people using it first are who? People who are doing illegal or gray market stuff people doing porn, people doing whatever, but, you know, video games, whatever. But 
all these activities that some people might consider useless or immoral or illegal or bad or, or they are illegal. But um, every single technology um, almost throughout history, the, the people who are on the edge, who are having a hard time opening up a bank account or being legitimate, legitimate or whatever, they are going to try the new technology to see if it can work. They're just less risk averse, partly be out of necessity and partly maybe because of personality. That's what attracted them to that industry in the first place, or they just have less options to be legitimate and they're desperate or just whatever they, but, but for whatever reason, there's a pattern, but that doesn't mean the technology can't be used for good. That's a really good point that, that, you know, these, these industries that are on the, on the edges anyway, like, like you said, like porn, like illegal industries, they sort of, have always driven innovation. It's not just in cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they they work hand in hand with uh, more open minded technologists who have great ideas, but they're looking. Often, it's great tech looking for a solution to solve or a problem to solve. A great solution to something they just don't know what it is. And um, people who have a real need that's being unmet, they might try to make the tech work for them. And then if, if it's close enough, I, I mean, if I had a big unmet need, whether I was in the porn industry or, or video games or whatever, I would go to the technologist who had something close and say, you are so close to what I need, but you're not there because ABC, you just need to change X, Y, Z, and then I will use it. Right. I will pay for it. I will pay money up front, whatever. Now, since um, I've been aware of you and I've noticed you come up on Facebook quite a bit, I'm curious, what are the things what are the things that you get passionate about and um, what are sort of the themes that you uh, are sharing? Sure. So a couple of things. One is um, I would like to see a distributed world where big government media businesses, and so forth. I would include probably unions, just anything big. Stops having so much power over people. Uh, otherwise, we are just working to centralize things while getting ourselves paid, but we become highly paid or overpaid or underpaid and generally underappreciated cogs in a machine. And, and I think now is a great time for people to think about if there is an alternative that's good enough, doesn't have to be the best, but good enough alternative to Western Union, to whatever, PayPal, maybe try crypto, give it a shot, right? Do, do you really want a world where your kids and grandkids are working for the man or um, working for, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, or whatever, as they get more and more powerful. So um, this, this this leads me to the question, sure. you know, with the, with the effort for a more distributed world, where do you place the current um, solutions that you've seen in cryptocurrency as far as delivering on that promise? Wow. Um, great question. And I've, I've written about this on Quora and Facebook and Twitter elsewhere. elsewhere. But um, basically, it's not great yet. So there's different ways to go about it. Probably the best way, if I had to guess, is you start distributed to stay distributed. It's kind of like diversity, right, in a startup. If you, if you want your company to be diverse, you start with a diverse team of founders, and then hopefully you can stay diverse. But um, same thing, my theory, is for distribution. At least that's how I would do it. So look, the Bitcoin blockchain is highly distributed. It's been unbreakable for nine years in a row. Okay, so that it's great code. There's been arguably a $300 billion bounty now or whatever the market cap is on Bitcoin, and no one's been able to steal everybody's Bitcoin. That differs somewhat from Ethereum, which arguably has a higher tax surface or does have a higher tax surface and has had DAO hacks and parity hacks and so forth. So Bitcoin is great. However, and it's also the least centralized, I would say probably by far of almost any coin that I know of or, or any coin out there. Um, however, 
Bitcoin is highly centralized in its subsystems and on ramps and off ramps. So the exchanges are centralized. I'm a fan of Coinbase. I've met their risk people. They're very smart. They're very good, right? And and doing the right thing, I think, to for new beginners to they can just go to Coinbase. It's pretty safe and reliable compared to um, a lot of the other exchanges, especially the shady ones. They're more compliant. They will try to protect their consumers, as we as we've seen. But at the end of the day, they're going to comply and work with regulators, not fight them the whole time. If I'm the government, right, I want what? To protect um, my people. So maybe Americans have their constitutional rights somewhat um, respected. But if you're not an American, then screw you or who cares? Because my job at the NSA is to protect Americans and also to protect the state. Right. So even if the government doesn't do anything, very smart hackers or a group of hackers that could be privately funded um, and have nothing to not much to do with the government, a little, nothing to do with the government could attack it. And then you also have ownership, which is highly centralized in Bitcoin and worse in other cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is the best, but it could be better. It's um, they think it will be illegal monopoly or oligopoly that is the job of a vc is to invest in legal monopolies and oligopolies and that's the job that warren buffett has and that's what peter Thiel looks for so you have libertarians democrats and and others everybody's looking for legal monopolies and oligopolies that's your job as an investor okay but so i get it but um the fact that sequoia invested should be a signal that hey it it's probably a, a monopoly. And what kind of monopoly is it? I think it's a vertical monopoly, potentially, or oligopoly. You know, that's interesting. One of the things in the recent podcast I did with Jackson Palmer of Dogecoin, he talked about exactly that. He said 2017 was not a good year for cryptocurrency when, you know, the common perception, it was this amazing year with all the valuations going so, so high. But his argument was that like a lot of that is Wall Street putting money in and they're only doing it because they see it as an investment. And that can hurt. In most cases, it does hurt the utility. Uh, yeah, so I, I haven't finished listening to your excellent interview with Jackson Palmer. I do notice that it's maximum popularity on iTunes, so I highly recommend people listen to it. But I listened to part of it and I agree with him. In terms of the parts that I listened to in the first uh, several minutes, I, I'm not sure I got to the part where he talked about Wall Street, but um, buying. But I, I actually think it's not so much Wall Street, but it is a lot of people from outside the original crypto community um, who might not care so much about decentralization and distributed systems, who are very um, focused on making money. And I wouldn't even use the term invest. I would say they're traders. And what people don't get is that traders don't necessarily need to understand the philosophy behind the asset or the coin. They don't care. They're going in anyway. So we have institutions capitulating, but we also have smart people, including from the crypto community kind of the, the more inner circle who are capitulating and just saying, having the view that yes, it's a bubble, but it's not going to pop soon, which is in my opinion, the definition of bubble type behavior. Right. I love that you've already pointed out, you know, uh, bubbles all pop and store value is something that retains its actual value. I mean, you know, I guess gold yeah, is like is that example. Are are I, yeah, I know that yeah. he's very interested in marketing and um, and th there are a lot of true believers, but you lose credibility with normal people, the normies uh, or and the noobs, if you keep calling it a store of value, and then people who are left holding, they bought it nineteen thousand, and now it's you know below below that, I think. So so or maybe they sold it you know fourteen thousand or whatever. So it's not great. To them, they, they lost money and it's not a story of value. So good luck with that argument. But So what, what, what advice do you give to people that are coming in new? I, I'm looking at a note you sent me about, you know, you being oh, passionate about helping folks at the margins, but wanting to kind of like help them get in. Yeah, the number one rule, if you get anything from my podcast and my rambling, 
is this. Please do not use margin unless you can cover the margin in a worst case scenario. So don't margin trade. Don't borrow money to trade even if you're getting great rates from your exchange because there is a great chance, if not a probability, that you will have to sell assets or borrow money from other people. The reason I feel so strongly about this, about not investing or trading more than you can afford to lose, not using margin or using more margin than you can afford to cover without selling your home or, or some asset you, you love or, or and putting great inconvenience to you or having to borrow money from a loved one is because I was the person who had to make a loan to actually my mom during the dot-com boom when I you know, was a 20-something, so we would call it a millennial now. And during the dot-com boom, she was day trading. She was making a lot of money. And then, of course, the bubble started popping and she got margin called and she didn't have enough cash. And she called me and I was in the middle of uh, uh, doing deals as a corporate lawyer on Wall Street. Or, or uh, um, And I was pissed or sorry. No, I was at – I apologize. I was at Morgan Stanley. Okay. and. Uh, uh, on the trading floor and I'd stop everything I was doing and go to my broker and dump a bunch of equity positions that I worked very hard to build and I liked those positions. <laughs> and yeah. I there. So I had to sell, raise cash and wire transfer to her. It was um, not a fun experience for me and I wasn't even the one being margin called. That's a close to home story. I can imagine that having a big impact. <laughs> Is, yes. there, is yeah. there any way that – is that information out there to look at how, mu how, how many people or how much um, of the buys out there are margined? No, the, the exchanges have that information, but because they're largely unregulated um, and a lot of them are outside the U.S., uh, it's hard to, hard to know. And it's possible the U.S. government has an idea, but they haven't prioritized it because it's – quote unquote, only, um, what is it, 800 billion or whatever. So the reason I say only is because, yeah, so 739 billion sounds like a lot. But what I want people at home to understand is think in terms of trillions of dollars, because I don't know, Gabe, if you know how, how many trillions of dollars there are in debt and equity globally. I mean, but, I, I read those numbers and they do, I cannot retain them because they're just so yeah, atomized with comprehension. So, so it's crazy. So it's basically almost three. Here's how I think about it. There's almost $600 trillion in real estate, equity, and debt, meaning stocks, bonds, and loans, and real estate. $600 trillion, It's actually more like 580 but let's just say 600 And about half is debt and equity and half is real estate. So globally, just these assets, not counting gold, which is – frankly, only like 7.7 .7 trillion, but um, 600 billion market cap is not a big deal. And when you apportion it or to like the U.S., maybe the U.S. has, let's say worst case, U.S. has about half of that, right? So it's 300 billion, 350 or 400 billion, sorry, 400 billion market cap of um, exposure to the U.S., but the U.S., a stock market is about 25 trillion and the, the debt market is about, I, I don't know what it is, um, maybe 150 billion, 150 trillion or 100 trillion or something like that. So, um, and, and the US GDP is almost 20 trillion. So, yes, it's a big number, the market cap, but it's not that big that the government should prioritize it and be scared, right? So, or feel imminently threatened it's a threat but it's a small uh low probability and kind of distant threat right we'll see what happens in 2018 if it goes to 10 trillion or or you know five trillion or whatever the margin thing is so interesting because i think as so many new people get into cryptocurrency mm -hmm. a lot of them don't even understand that some of these exchanges do allow you to buy on margin but they do understand enter your credit card here you know and, and, you know, be able to buy, buy crypto with your credit card. Yeah. 
So what kinds of things do you do to keep up um, on what's happening and what are you looking for? What are you watching? Sure. So um, I'm on Twitter a lot, which is not for everybody. So Twitter is very blunt and rude and there's a lot of junk there. But um, I've recently found that, so I've tried Twitter many times in many ways. I just experiment, right? So I found that if you make sure you don't come off sarcastic. Uh, so sometimes I am sarcastic on Twitter, but when I want an answer, I'll put in parenthesis seriously asking, right, if, to my question, because I'm genuinely interested. Right. Or I'll say something like, with respect, right, blah, 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 blah. So I did that with F2 Pool because there is um, a bunch of people on Twitter talking about how F2 Pool, who's a big miner uh, in China, about how he was not going to signal Segwit2x hard fork. And I said, but but yet he was, so he said that, but then he was still mining as, as if he was going to signal Segwit2x hard fork. So I said, with respect, you know, and I kind of, took a screenshot and he actually replied and said, no, no, it's because, because the, the problem with having centralized mining is because, is that none of us can mine because it's none of us mine because it's uneconomic to do so unless you're part of a big mining pool and you have really fast, many, many computers and you have very cheap or subsidized electricity, which means you're in China, Venezuela, maybe the state of Washington, Ukraine, Russia, North Korea, and so forth, right? So a lot of it is in China. So anyway, so FT Pool said, look, um, we, we can't, we are going to signal that, that we're not um, supporting Segwit2x hard fork, but not yet because we can't just stop the, the mining system or whatever. There was some mining reason for that. And nobody had asked them that. And they were just debating back and forth and trolling each other on Twitter, kind of um, saying, no, he said this. No, that he didn't say it. So you're wrong. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. So Twitter's a, a shithole, a cesspool of crap. But there is a way to get a lot of information really fast from a lot of experts. Right. So Twitter's really good for that. And I created a group just to, um, a co created a group with my friend Luke Shi just to give myself a plug here, um, for thoughtful, relevant, nice crypto discussions. You have to be <laughs> nice to each other. You don't have to be nice to, you know, if you hate Roger Ver, you hate, you know, Adam Back or Mangan Sire, whatever. You don't have to be nice to them. Or, well, actually, Emmons in our group, but <laughs> Roger <laughs> and uh, Adam, as far as I know, are not. But uh, it's a group called Crypto Central. I call it Central just kind of as, because I'm very sarcastic, as kind of a, uh, mocking, but mocking the the centralization in crypto and just, but also because it is a centralized group because there's two administrators. But the reason that there are two administrators is because I had started another Facebook group that had nothing to do with crypto called Straight Allies for Marriage Equality or Straight Allies. And I had many administrators and one of the administrators removed me as an administrator from the group and I was pissed. <laughs> I had to kind of get when my you way. Had the, you had created it and got removed? It was a coup. Yeah. I, I made a bunch of people <laughs> administrators because I thought I could trust them and, you know, they seemed nice and I didn't want to be like the only guy. So instead we have many, many moderators and that's been really good because we let anybody post and there's been very good thoughtful discussion. To complete, to just to complete the plug, um, folks can go on Facebook and find Crypto Central. That's the group you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah cool. Thank you. You're better at this than I am. <laughs> <laughs> to put the plug on it. Um, okay, so coming into this new year, um, what yep. do you think are the interesting approaches, whether coins or not? So a good friend of mine, Steve Hoffman, who's a founder of Founder Space, a top-ranked international accelerator in Silicon Valley, uh, he gives a talk that is pretty bearish on cryptocurrencies more bearish than I am, believe it or not. But when I ask him about smart contracts, he actually likes it, and I agree with him. So I like smart contract projects. I like um, security projects because when you have Ethereum that is um, hacked or attacked through the DAO and parity and so forth, it's an issue, I think, and I like privacy coins. So, so here's what I believe. 
Throughout history, there's been problems with governments eventually screwing up. You have Weimar Republic, you have Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, uh, many countries in Latin America, many countries in Asia. China used to have hyperinflation and Europe and just around the world, globe, almost universally, many, many governments have screwed up and hurt their own people by having hyperinflation or economic contraction. Japan contracted until last year for 26 years in a row. Okay, so when governments are destroying value and causing people to lose jobs, there will be a flight to safety and to alternatives. Sometimes people will want to move money out of the country even if they themselves can't leave the country, right? So. Bitcoin or some other privacy coin can be a great capital flight conduit. So I like capital flight conduit plays, um, but they require decentralized exchanges and decentralized wallets and decentralized on-ramps and off-ramps. Meaning anytime you go from fiat or US dollars or Venezuelan Bolivar to crypto and back to, so, so a lot of people I think in Venezuela, I. I believe, I don't have data on this, but it just makes sense to me. A lot of wealthy people are, are, are semi-wealthy people in Venezuela are moving money from Venezuelan Bolivar, which is 800% inflation a year, it's horrible currency, to Bitcoin, back to and then back to fiat, but they're gonna back, go back to fiat in terms of Swiss francs, US dollars, maybe euros, maybe something else. So I, I like uh, privacy coins and, and Bitcoin um, or just coins that look like they can be a good capital flight conduit and have a potential, the potential to be a store of value and sensor resistance. Store of value means you can get retain value. You can't retain value if, if you have to rely on a corrupt or unstable government to stay in power and rely on them to not take confiscate your assets because i think a lot of it comes down to distributed systems decentralization immutability meaning other people can't change it can't reverse a transaction but also sensor resistant meaning the state the government cannot prevent you from doing something let me ask you i mean from from with your background those kinds of things are concepts you know that are pretty built in for you. How hard is it for somebody to, um, you know, read a white paper or do research to determine the degrees to which a coin is successful at those areas? N number one, I would say um, find a friend who is technical. So I'm not technical, or I haven't coded since high school. People think I'm technical, but I'm not. So preferably have it audited, right? So um, I, I like Quantstamp, just to plug Quantstamp a bit. I have um, tokens from them and I'm friends with the, the founders. But Quantstamp is great because they're trying to automate security audits and automate bug bounties. So you have both manual and uh, p very smart humans and very good machines and algorithms auditing the same code. It's a good idea to read the white paper to see if that uh, makes sense or not and look at the team. Um, I would like, I would like um, traders to consider or investors to consider ICO investors to consider going to a meetup where the the founders are speaking. I, I have a little bit of stellar um, just because I'm um, friends with one of the folks who work at Lightyear, which is the, the, the red hat to stellar because I think um, Jed McCaleb, if you look at Jed, right, he's very smart. He's, he can, it seems like he can kind of see the future and he's very focused on, payments and remittances and not trying to attack or try to get a partnership with Western Union or MoneyGram. That's very hard, but kind of going a layer below and um, with uh, with Stellar. And he's someone also who is very private. So and he doesn't defend himself on social media. And the reason I mentioned that is because that could not necessarily that could correlate with Stellar being undervalued because he doesn't defend himself and do a lot of PR. He's not on Twitter all day. That, having said that, I think Stellar's had a big run up as well, just not as much as Ripple and some of these other uh, crazy coins like Tron. It, all the coins are overvalued. A Stellar, a Bitcoin might be pretty good. Maybe, maybe Litecoin, possibly, M maybe Bitcoin Cash. Um, I, I like, I like that you went there. My next question was going to be, who, who are. Who, <laughs> Who, who, who else are the technical 
thought leaders that you think are worth listening to? You mentioned, you know, Jed McCaleb. Sure. Who, who else are some of the smart folks in, that, are, that are technical? So I'm going to name people from the BTC side, the BC, BCH side, and the kind of outside that area. So Vitalik is very smart. He, um, Vitalik Buterin is worth listening to. Also on the BCH side or, or the big blocker side is MN Gunsire, the Cornell professor. Peter Todd, even though his personality on Twitter grates on me sometimes, he's actually very smart. So last time I said Adam back from the Blockstream CEO, I think Peter Todd had a pretty interesting exchange that um, someone recently tweeted out that was from a few years ago, I think on Bitcoin Talk Forum or one of those forums where the developers are talking to each other. And at the time, it's just the Bitcoin core developers. And he, Gavin Andreessen and Michael Hearn, were, were having a discussion with each other from a few years ago. And it's interesting to see how um, Bitcoin, for better or worse, the, the Bitcoin community has rallied around his line of thinking, not to say that he was the leader in that thinking, but which is the view that security must trump speed and convenience and low fees. That, that's, um, that's so interesting. I mean, every, every argument I've heard is, you know, keep the block size the same for Bitcoin or increase it. This is the first I've heard of decreasing yes. it. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. I want all the experiments to run, and I also want Bitcoin Unlimited to get more backing because if there's – Vitalik said this. There's a good chance that the right answer is not 1, 2, 4, or 8, or 16 MBs, that, that it's um, 350, like Luke said, or unlimited. Either nodes matter or they don't, right? Either hash rate matters or – or no, full nodes matter. So the, the test should be actually, so there should be no BCH, there should just be Bitcoin limited, and there, BTC should just be uh, smaller blocks. And then we can see more clearly if big blocks matter or not, if hash rate matters or not, or full nodes matter or not, and if there's going to be um, centralization by, by miners or by developers or whatever. The market will do what the market wants. Right, I, I get the uh, idea. Like, do the experiments on the extreme so you can get some more, you know, actionable or insightful, real information. Hey, hey just a couple of questions. Are, are there any any uh, events coming up the, in San Francisco that you're excited about? Yes. So um, I'm going to make a plug for Decentralized Fridays by Jackson Palmer, hosted by Jackson Palmer, where um, every Friday you in San Francisco at three Parkside Bar. There is um, just drinks from 5.30 to 8.30. People are very nice. Um, and you know, I met some great people who used to work at Facebook and, and others. Um, and, and that's a great event that happens every Friday at 3 Parkside in the Mission. Okay, well, Terrence, where, where do people uh, find you or follow you? How do they find out more? I'm on Twitter at Yang Ventures, but just fair warning, I can be um, very snarky and sarcastic there. On Quora, I'm smart, snarky and sarcastic still because that's just me, but, but I have to be nice and respectful to a large extent on Quora. And then Crypto Central, I'm very nice because I, I force myself to be. Because I, otherwise, I'll be kicked out of my own group. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Terrence. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Gabe. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. bye. Hey, if you're enjoying Coloring Crypto, we would love your support. Leave a review on iTunes and go support our sponsors, coloringcrypto.com slash sponsors.